Uh, I guess my microphone's working. I think this might be the first time I've uh, spoken at a security summit instead of being the MC. Uh, and so this will just be a brief uh, high level overview of Linux kernel security. Uh, it may be a little high level for some of the more experienced folk here, but we want to bring more people into the community. Uh, and this is kind of, I guess, a bit of a level set. And there will be more detailed drill downs into the, the uh, various aspects of the, the uh, kernel security uh, framework uh, in, in subsequent talks. Uh, so just quickly, as, as, as mentioned, I maintain uh, the security subsystem tree, uh, which collects quite a lot of the security functionality uh, to push to Linux, uh, but security is spread out through the tree, uh, so the, the borders of that are fairly nebulous. Uh, it's really a, uh, it's a community effort uh, spread across you know, many, many people, dozens of people. Uh, I'm employed as a, a kernel engineer at Microsoft, uh, I work on, uh, well, they pay me to do the upstream maintenance and I also work on uh, Linux security uh, architecture uh, at Microsoft. Um, and previously I had been involved in uh, NetFilter. Uh, I was the original author of the uh, crypto API, so I'm the one to blame for, for that API. Uh, I was involved in the original LSM development and uh, I worked on uh, SE Linux at Red Hat. And prior to this role, I was actually a kernel manager at Oracle. So I've gone back to more technical uh, type of work. Uh, so I will just do a bit of a background into uh, Linux kernel security, which will help explain some of how it's become the way it's come, uh, become and why. Uh, and I'll go through at a high level uh, some of the major components of Linux kernel security, and then I'll in include some resources for people who want to get involved or who want to learn more or contribute uh, at the end. And these slides are actually up on the website if you go to the event page uh, in slides uh, and have a look there. Uh, so the Linux kernel security model is, uh, it's based on Unix, so it's well known that Linux was a clone of Unix, <clears throat> and as such it inherited the uh, security model from Unix, which is fairly rudimentary. Uh, it's called DAC, uh, Discretionary Access Control, and this essentially says that uh, if you create an object, and you own that object, then you can set the security permissions of uh, who can access and access that, and the permissions are fairly coarse, and it keeps it fairly simple. Um, and it, it does a reasonably good job uh, for, for when it was designed. It was actually uh, designed in the late 1960s and implemented in the 70s. <clears throat> um, and it was actually a different, completely different culture then. You didn't have APTs. Uh, you didn't have um, the internet uh, as we know it. Uh, and there was also a different cultural uh, factor at the time where people were trying to share. There wasn't really much of a concept. And still today, if you find an old Unix system, even from more recent decades, uh, sometimes there'll be no password set on root. Uh, so, you know, the systems would just be brought up and used by people. So one of the originators of Unix, Dennis Ritchie, wrote a paper in 1979 called On the Security of Unix where he did a very good security analysis. It's actually a good paper to look up and read because it also shows you how to go about doing security analysis. He was a very smart guy. And this is where the quote comes from. So I, this is what I, how I found this paper. I was trying to dig up this uh, sometimes repeated quote. Uh, and he said that Unix was not developed with security in any realistic sense in mind. And he said this fact alone guarantees a vast number of holes. So in 1979, uh, this was the guarantee that uh, Dennis made in that paper. And I think that if you have been tracking Unix and Unix family and Linux security in recent decades, uh, you, you, can, you, you would agree that uh, that lack of design. Uh, so one of the issues there is that in Linux and other operating systems that were designed in, in similar eras had to retrofit security with breaking the existing applications. And that's been very difficult. And in particular, Linux is very uh, stringent about not breaking user space. So there are all kinds of amazing uh, security models and security ideas out there and uh, that have been proposed over many decades, but 
for us in the Linux world, in reality, we have to ensure that we don't uh, break existing user space. So one of the, the core issues, uh, and uh, to give a bit of a background as to why there are so many extensions and enhancements to uh, Linux security, is that discretionary access control is insufficient for modern security threats. And this was outlined really well in a paper that was produced along with the original SE Linux uh, project by the US National Security Agency, uh, where they were making the case for mandatory access control. I think it's called uh, The Inevitability of Failure is the, is the paper. But essentially, discretionary access control in particular doesn't protect against flawed or malicious code. So just if you uh, own an object, um, Oh, if you, if, you own, yeah, if you own objects and you run a piece of code and that code is malicious, uh, then the DAC provides no protection against that. Um, it also doesn't cover all security critical functions. So original Unix security was based on the file system and uh, inode permissions. Uh, so for example, with uh, network facing demons, there's, uh, there's very limited uh, security functionality in the, in the traditional uh, Unix model. And, uh, for example, if you have a uh, web server, web server uh, listening on port 80 um, and that becomes compromised, then it can be quite easily turned into a, uh, a mail server uh, to send spam around uh, and discretionary access control really has uh, no impact on that. Uh, and also, in particular, if it's uh, running with privilege, then it will have access to all kinds of things that it doesn't need usually under DAC. And the other aspect of DAC is that the super user or the root user uh, can essentially do anything, and this actually violates the security model that you've implemented. Uh, and so in that same paper, Dennis Ritchie pointed this out, uh, and again, I'd say this a very smart guy, uh, saying that if you have the notion of a super user, then it's a, a theoretical and usually practical blemish on any protection scheme. So that historically, the amount of problems we've had with uh, privilege and super user uh, escalation uh, is, is significant. So that, that forms the, uh, I guess, the background as to then how we've had been uh, involved in retrofitting security extensions to Linux to meet the requirements for the modern era and the 21st century, even the parts of the 20th century. Uh, so some of these components include POSIX ACLs, access control list. So this essentially takes what's known as abbreviated ACLs in the Unix uh, DAC model and makes them fine-grained. Uh, so then instead of just having um, user, group, and other permissions, you can actually specify which particular users, which particular groups, uh, and it's much more fine-grained. And that is still discretionary access control. So it's more flexible and more fine-grained, uh, more complicated but still has some of those fundamental issues. And POSIX is that I think this was based on a, an early POSIX standard when there were standards in, in right. Unix. Draft standard. So Casey Schaeffler here, the, the SMAC author, was involved in this, uh, this work. Uh, we also have uh, Linux capabilities or POSIX capabilities, another draft spec. And so for people coming from other operating systems, this is, uh, this is actually called privileges in, in some other operating systems. And it's not the capabilities that you may hear of in uh, other, other areas of computer security. So it's unfortunately a bit of a uh, namespace collision here. So the capabilities, POSIX capabilities, essentially attempts to deal with the super user issue uh, by decomposing the super user or decomposing root into a set of high level abstractions uh, such as network admin, sysadmin, uh, being able to bind to, uh, sorry, open and access raw networking sockets to craft packets uh, for things like ping. Uh, this is process based and uh, initially, the initial version of capabilities, you had to assign it uh, to assign these capabilities to the process as it was running and being launched. Uh, later on, it became much more useful when file system labels were attached to capabilities. Uh, so, typically with capabilities, you'll have a privileged app such as a mail server will start up, do all the privileged things it needs to do and then drop the capabilities. And that sounds great, but that has actually, has actually led to some security issues itself, quite famously. Um, 
We're also not quite sure exactly what some of these capabilities mean. They've just been sprinkled throughout the kernel without a kind of a centralized design. So people make a best effort. So I remember when I was working as, you know, as a networking developer, uh, you would just use CapNet admin if you did anything privileged uh, or thought it might be privileged. So this has been implemented by kernel developers and they've actually done a, a reasonable job or we've done a, a reasonable job. Um, but it's a little hard to reason about what sort of security you may really have. Um, and it's, uh, it, it can lead to privilege escalation. You don't know where the boundaries of your privilege are. If you have a, a series of um, executables that you launch with different capabilities, you don't necessarily know exactly what you're going to end up with. Uh, and it's difficult to analyze. And it's still uh, a form of discretionary access control. Uh, so there's an audit subsystem in the kernel, and this is implemented to help uh, meet government security requirements. And one of the surprising things about this is it's actually quite useful. So you can actually run audit to uh, audit commands such as audit control to watch files for them being updated and, and so on. Uh, so that's, that's really well implemented. And I say that because I know that in uh, other operating systems, trusted operating systems and so on, you'd have this C2 requirement. And I've heard that it was never enabled in the field. Uh, audit. It was just a, a checkbox. So audit's quite useful. It's integrated with the other security mechanisms. Uh, SecComp is a major uh, advancement in really useful security in the kernel. Uh, it's a kind of a generalized system call filter. So uh, for a process, you can actually specify essentially a whitelist of system calls uh, that an application has. And it was initially started with, I think, three system calls, the initial version of it. And this was to do uh, allow people to rent out computing time on the computers and you had like input, uh, read and write and I think like an exit system call. So you, yeah, SIG return, yeah, that's it. So four, four system calls. And so was this Andrea Akangeli made this? Uh, and this was like your SETI at home type workloads, uh, um, crypto uh, key cracking things. And I guess now you'd be you know, looking at bit, <laughs> Bitcoin mining. Uh, for that kind of thing. And then it was extended uh, to be a more generalized filter. And it's implemented as BPF, uh, BPF filters. Uh, it's really useful for reducing the attack surface of the kernel, and by which I mean <clears throat> by uh, wh essentially whitelisting your system calls. Uh, if there is a bug in a system call that you don't need and someone can get in and trick the kernel into executing, say, there was a, 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 a T system call uh, that had a bug in it, uh, it, it really blocks a lot of uh, kernel exploits. And I think the Android security folk have demonstrated this. Uh, uh, if you look at the previous uh, security summit in North America, there's an interesting presentation on that. Uh, and it's not inherently a sandbox on its own, but it's certainly a useful component of sandboxing. Uh, if you want to use seccomp, don't try and uh, use it directly. That's like writing assembly code. libseccomp by Paul Moore here is a, is a very good tool for that. Um, I think if you use Docker, you'll find like a JSON file with, with some policies, some set comp policies and so on, so you can see how that works. Uh, namespaces, this is another significant increase uh, in security, although it's not inherently a security feature. It just happens to be very useful. So namespaces were derived from concepts from the Plan 9 operating system, which was uh, the successor to Unix. And what it does, it allows uh, a process to have private views of global resources. And then a really simple example would be to give a process a private version of temp that nobody else can write to. Uh, and then that will eliminate an entire class of uh, temp race directories. Um, it's integrated into PAM, pluggable authentication modules. And containers are built on uh, namespaces with C groups. So if you start combining, say, namespaces and set comp, and C groups, you're starting to be able to do some interesting isolation and, and uh, attack surface reduction. Uh, there's also in the networking is the uh, net, net filter framework, which has now been around for nearly 20 years, or it's certainly about 19 years in development. Uh, and there is some uh, EPVF based work, which looks to uh, replace that uh, in the near future. But net filter is a set of hooks in the layer three uh, the, the, the network layer in the kernel. Uh, wherever the packets flow through, uh, it's abstracted out to input, <laughs> output, forwarding, and so on. 
and then you can plug uh, applications into NetFilter such as IP tables. Uh, the cryptography API certainly has uh, changed a lot since I was initially involved in it. Uh, there are many different types of algorithms supported. Uh, there's synchronous and asynchronous APIs. Uh, it was intended initially as a zero copy interface, uh, and that's why uh, there's some perceived complexity there. Uh, there's support for crypto hardware, and uh, there's a user space API, and it's extensively used by disk encryption, uh, network encryption, such as IPsec. Uh, key management and the integrity uh, subsystem. Uh, there's a key management framework and we'll be getting a, hopefully a good update on that from David Howells uh, soon. Uh, this is about how the kernel manages keys, key rings and tokens. Uh, and each key has a set of attributes, permissions, owner and so on. Uh, and there are different types of keys. So you have per process keys uh, for a user or a session and you have uh, trusted keys, which are uh, the kernel managers, which are sealed inside the TPM. And that's uh, a very good way of uh, protecting the keys from uh, being exposed through kernel vulnerabilities. Uh, there's also encrypted keys, which are similar, but don't use the, uh, the TPM. And there's a user space API for interacting. Uh, the LSM framework, or Linux Security Modules, uh, is a pluggable framework that allows uh, different access control models to be implemented. And this was initially uh, implemented in re in re as a reaction to Linus's reaction to SE Linux being proposed. Uh, and he didn't want to have a single uh, security model being implemented. Um, he wasn't sure if that would uh, suit everybody. So the consensus came around to implement a framework where you could plug in SE Linux and other, uh, other security frameworks such as AppArmor. Uh, so this is a hook API and you can think of it a bit like uh, NetFilter in that you, we have abstracted out where you have, uh, instead of packets, you have just general <coughs> processing uh, of, uh, through the kernel. And these hooks are race free. So they're done in a, in a, a place which is safe in terms of locking and they have all of the security relevant uh, information available at that point. Uh, and so this then allows us to implement security models which are, uh, can be done safely and with, uh, with a wide variety of different types of uh, policies. Um, so there are several types or several major LSMs. Uh, these would be SE Linux, AppArmor and Smack. And currently uh, they can't be stacked with each other because they're too complex. Uh, Casey is, will be giving a talk about that. And there are minor stackable uh, LSMs which are stacked with one of the major ones. So for example, it would be typical that you would have SE Linux or AppArmor or Smack with capabilities and, and uh, Yama, which has just got a few, uh, few security features implemented. Uh, in terms of the major security models, um, security enhanced Linux is a, what's called a label-based mandatory access control and uh, compared to discretionary access control uh, this uh, is has a centrally uh, administered security policy so if you have an object you don't necessarily be able to you're not necessarily able to set the policy on who can access that and this addresses issues with malware uh, and a number of types of security issues um, it has fine-grained general permissions, so originally mandatory access control was uh, associated with military uh, type security models, whereas SE Linux uh, changed this to be more general purpose and it's uh, implemented in Fedora-based uh, OSs and also Android. Um, SMAC is a simplified label-based mandatory access control system. Uh, has a smaller code footprint and a much smaller policy footprint, and this is typically seen in the embedded space uh, and in the Tizen project. Uh, AppArmor is a different approach. Instead of uh, attaching security labels directly to objects, uh, the security is path name based, and uh, this was designed for ease of use so that people would have Unix-like configuration files. Uh, and this is implemented in SUSE and Ubuntu 
So we also have, and that, that's probably about the fastest, <laughs> the fastest ex, uh, explanation of all of those security models and LSM that you'll ever hear. Uh, platform security is also an area where the kernel uh, has been actively developed. And this, I would include anything that is a security feature provided either by the, the hardware or the firmware. So we have things like TPM, we have trusted execution environments, uh, extensions such as SGX, um, the AMD uh, in memory encryption. We also have uh, certain uh, ISA enhancements such as you know, NX and SMEP. Uh, so this is all supported in the kernel. Uh, there's an integrity management subsystem, and uh, within this we have the integrity measurement architecture, and this allows us to essentially extend secure boot or verified boot to the OS so we can uh, continue measuring user space components, and they can be executables, they can be config files, and these measurements can be extended into the TPM, and you can then perform uh, remote attestation uh, with that. And, uh, you're also able to have digitally signed files, and upon access, the, the signatures are checked. Uh, so that, that's quite useful in terms of being able to verify that a system that you bring up um, does not have any malware persisted, that it's in a known state. The EVM, Extended Verification Module, protects the security attributes. So security attributes are extensions of the inode on files in Linux. And they contain uh, security information such as SE Linux labels, IMA labels, uh, SMAC labels, and so on, including also POSIX ACLs and um, maybe a few other things. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, so all of these are covered against offline attack. And we also have some uh, block level integrity uh, checking. We have DM Verity and DM Integrity. And this was implemented, I think, for uh, Chrome OS initially. And this actually checks uh, a, a disk when you mount it and you start accessing it. Uh, and the entire disk is essentially uh, verified. And then you, you can use the load pin module to ensure that if you're uh, loading kernel modules, that they all come off this trusted partition. Uh, another important aspect which has become more prominent in the past few years is kernel self-protection, and this is hardening the kernel itself against attack. Uh, several years ago, I would say this was probably an area which was um, deficient in Linux, and so we've had significant efforts by Case and others uh, with their kernel self-protection project, uh, and significant improvements have been made there, and I believe Case will be updating us on that. Uh, and so some of this, or much of this work, is backporting or porting the uh, geosecurity and PACS work to mainline, and that's uh, been very politically and technically challenging on many fronts. Uh, and the emphasis on this is, uh, the focus is on killing bug classes versus individual bugs, uh, so that instead of playing whack-a-mole with every bug that comes up, it's like, well, let's get rid of this class of attack. And an example there of uh, attacking, uh, getting rid of a class of attacks is like the temp race, uh, type vulnerabilities that you can get rid of by using uh, namespaces. Okay, in terms of resources, uh, the LSM mailing list has evolved into a place where many, if not most, of the kernel security developers hang out and discuss things. There are some other mailing lists. The Linux Integrity mailing list also includes TPM discussion. Uh, there's the Linux key rings, and also outs these are on the same uh, kernel.org uh, server. There's also the OSS security mailing list, which is a very good general, um, general security resource. Uh, and that's at OpenWall, and that's uh, run by um, someone who is uh, very influential in buffer overruns back in the day. Um, there's a wiki, kernsec.org, where we try and keep uh, information and resources. Please feel free to create an account and update that. You know what, it's like with uh, wikis, they get out of date and people forget about them and they die a sad death. Uh, and there's also a very good resource, uh, the LWN security link there. Uh, if you subscribe to LWN, uh, you will have access to really probably the best, um, best coverage of Linux security. So I'm not sure if we have any more time, but we're any... They actually do have 
Okay. So I don't know if this works now. So if I forgot to mention, so if there are questions, we can take one from the mic, so please just wave and I'll run. It's, not, it's more a comment. Uh, the keyrings mailing list isn't le Linux dash keyrings, it's just keyrings. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? Still. <laughs> Thanks for talk. Another uh, aspect about mailing lists. So, uh, OSS security is the mailing list with about vulnerabilities and open source projects in, gen in general. Yeah. And kernel hardening is the mailing list for the kernel hardening efforts. Yes, I forgot uh, kernel hardening. They are listed at kernsec.org. Thanks. And similarly, the, I didn't think it was mentioned on the slide, but the Linux hardened IRC channel. Okay. So then for the KSPP stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I haven't been active on there. So I think kernsec.org has, has stuff there. So what aren't we working on that we need to be working on? To, I think we still have some, some progress to make in the kernel hardening. Um, yeah, there's, well, Case can, can talk about that. Uh, but yeah, I think what would be good would be to see more uh, original research being implemented in the, in the upstream kernel uh, as well once, once, once the, the basics are covered there. I think that would be interesting to see what kind of new approaches uh, would be good. Uh, I think really it's, you know, it's, it's up to people to figure out what they need and what they want to see. So, I, you know, I don't have a magic crystal ball of, of what people need. Usability can always, <laughs> security usability. So that's not so much a kernel thing, that's really an integration thing. Being developer friendly, not maybe the security community, but like Linux kernel community yeah. is still not so it looks security friendly, but I don't know how to work on that. Any more questions? Because this is still an overview, so I guess more detailed questions will come when we get into each subsystem. So let's thank James. <laughs> Thanks.